Update and Sustainability Technical Conference scheduled in docket number 20-057-02, Dominion Energy Utah's Integrated Resource Plan for plan year June 1, 2020 to May 31, 2021. My name is Eric Martinson and I'm the PSU's facilitator for this conference. As stated in our December 17, 2020 Notice of Electronic Technical Conference in this docket, pursuant to Utah Code Title 52, Chapter 54, Section 207, PSC chair has made a written determination that due to COVID, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the continued risk of transmission in Utah, an anchor location would provide a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. Also as stated in our January 7 amended notice in this docket, given the confidential nature of certain items that Dominion Energy will present, a portion of this technical conference will be closed to participants who have not executed a non-disclosure agreement. We'll turn the time now to Mr. Mendenhall and Dominion Energy. Thanks. Great, thank you. So can you see my uh, screen okay, my presentation? It's showing up great on my screen. All right, great. So thank you, I appreciate uh, everyone showing up today. Uh, yeah, we've got some exciting things to talk about. And uh, so we've got a few presenters today. I'll be presenting, I'm Kelly Mendenhall. I work in the regulatory uh, group for Dominion Energy Utah. And then we've got Judd Cook uh, from our operations group, Casey Workle, who's uh, from our operations group with WexPro, and Will Schwarzenbach, who manages our gas supply area. So uh, between the four of us, uh, we'll, we'll be tackling all of the content here. Um, so bear with me, I, I, uh, the advancing on this probably isn't gonna work very well. Um, Let's start by talking about where we've been and then talk about kind of where we would like to be. And so I started, I want to start with uh, a few uh, pictures. Uh, and you'll notice, uh, you might notice the picture on the left. Uh, you might wonder why no one's wearing a mask. Uh, that's because this picture was taken in 1929, over 90 years ago, when uh, natural gas was first brought to the Salt Lake Valley. And this was a celebration. Um, where they there to see it. Um, but before we got to that point, uh, we had to go through a lot of work to get there. And the picture on the right, uh, you see a bunch of horses stuck in mud. So that was in 1929 when uh, we were, we were a, a, a oil and gas exploration uh, and didn't know what to do with it. I uh, wanted to take it to Denver, but Denver had already received natural gas. And so they thought the next best place would be Salt Lake City. And so uh, the, the 1929 from Southwest Wyoming uh, through the canyon to Salt Lake. And you can see uh, the, the mode of uh, construction back then was a little different. They used horses instead of uh, bulldozers uh, and excavators, uh, but they got it done. And so since that time, um, we've provided safe, affordable, reliable energy. That's, that's been the goal. Um, and and uh, for 90 years, we've been doing a part of American life. Um, and, and it's that way all over the country. You have 180 million Americans who use it. We add 600,000 Americans each year. Uh, here in Utah, we got over 1.1 million customers. And last year, we added 28,000 customers. Uh, on our system. And so uh, natural gas is alive and well. And due to the economic growth in Utah, um, where we're seeing uh, its use, uh, it's it being used more and more uh, each year. And, uh, but as we go forward, um, we, we feel like we need to add uh, a component to the safe, reliable, affordable service. And that is, uh, and so that's really what we're here to talk about today. Um, and we want to talk to you a little bit about the initiatives that we've got. So you might ask, why, why is sustainability? Why are we talking about that? And, um, you know, we have a lot of stakeholders. We have customers. We have shareholders. Uh, we have policymakers. And um, they're all uh, kind of unified in the fact that they want to see um, more uh, sustainable 
energy choices, uh, and they want us to be uh, to be addressing climate change. And so uh, these this infographic just shows, um, you know, sixty nine percent of our consumers want uh, want aggressive action to address climate change. Eighty percent of our investors um, want uh, to see us use less carbon intensive energy sources. And then across the states and localities, you may be have followed some of this. Uh, you've got you're you're seeing um, locales and states who are um, changing energy policies and um, looking for more sustainable ways to do things. Talk a little bit about uh, the meaning energy's goals. Thanks, Kelly. Um, as Kelly mentioned, my name's Jug Cook. I work in our gas operations group, and I've met several of you. And for those of you who ha I haven't met, it's it's nice to meet you at least virtually. Uh, I've been asked to come in and talk about some of our sustainability goals. And as Kelly mentioned, you know, it's not enough uh, for us as a utility company to be safe, reliable, efficient anymore. Our our uh, customers and consumers expect us to be sustainable as well. And I think it's worth a discussion about what exactly that means, what it means to be sustainable. And oftentimes when people hear, um, hear the word sustainable, they think that means doing the right thing for the environment. And, and certainly it does, but to truly be sustainable, something's gotta be more than just the right thing for the environment. It's also gotta be the right thing socially and the right thing economically. So, you know, it has to make sense economically, it has to make sense for the environment, it has to make sense socially, it has to make sense for the people um, who are using our product. And we're, we're doing a lot of work around this and we feel like we found, you know, a handful of projects, a handful of areas where we can do things that are truly sustainable. They tick all of those boxes. They're the right thing environmentally, they're the right thing economically, and they're the right thing socially. And we want to talk about those things today. And, and one of them is doing what we need to do to reduce our methane emissions. Now, this isn't a new initiative for us. This is something we've been doing for years, for decades, in fact. I mean, even since the 80s, uh, we've been taking steps to reduce our methane emissions. It was in the 80s and early 90s that we replaced all of our cast iron and our bare, bare steel pipe, which it is equipment leaks that, that provide the most or emit the most methane in a, in a LDC system. So we've set goals to reduce those methane emissions. We've already reduced those emissions by 25%, and we intend to reduce those, further reduce those by 65% and 80% uh, by 2030 and 2040, respectively. And in order to do that, um, we have a, there are a handful of things we're gonna do. We're reducing and eliminating venting. We're replacing aging infrastructure and we're expanding our leak detection and repair programs. And I'll talk um, specifically about all of those in, in just a second. Another major initiative that we have planned uh, revolves around renewable natural gas. Um, we're investing billions of dollars, in fact, up to $2 billion by 2035 in renewable natural gas projects. And uh, you may have heard a little bit about our uh, partnership with Smithfield Fruit Foods. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Smithfield Foods, they're the world's largest pork producer. So they uh, operate hundreds, thousands of hog farms all across the country. And we've decided to partner with them to convert those hog farms over to renewable natural gas producing facilities. Uh, the first of which, and I think Kelly will talk about a little more about this in a minute, but the first of which came online a few months ago in Milford, Utah. Uh, it was a collection of 60 hog farms um, we gather the, the, the gas, the methane that's produced at those hog farms, clean it up, and it's injected into a pipeline uh, to be used just like any other geologic natural gas. Further, in our renewable natural gas program, um, by 2040, we intend to capture more emissions with RNG than we emit from our system. And I'll tell you a little more about what's being emitted from our system here in just a second. So Kelly, next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the reasons we think renewable natural gas is such a, a terrific project, or it's a project that really is the very definition of sustainability when we talk about environmentally, economically, and socially, is because renewable natural gas is the only fuel source that actually has a negative carbon footprint. 
And the reason it has a negative carbon footprint is because methane, which is, is generated from the waste from these hogs or from, from dairy farms, is actually 25 times more potent to greenhouse gas than carbon. So when you capture that, you're doing, you're doing significant work in cleaning up the environment. So it's actually a sign, a negative, when you convert those the methane emissions over to a carbon equivalent uh, basis, it's actually given a negative carbon uh, rating. So what that means is essentially there is no better fuel for heating your home and water, for generating electricity, for powering vehicles uh, than renewable natural gas if you're trying to do the right thing from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective. There's no better fuel bar now. Uh, we talked a little bit about the projects we're doing. They've got some pictures of some hog farms there. Uh, but our program, we intend to uh, capture 3.5 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent uh, annually. And that's the equivalent of taking 750,000 cars off the road or planting 60 million new trees. So we we think or believe that renewable natural gas projects are the perfect example of sustainable projects and we'll be investing heavily in them in the future. And you'll hear more about it as we move forward. Thanks, Chad. So uh, today we'd like to talk about what we're currently doing <clears throat> on the uh, sustainability front. And then we'll also talk about um, things we've got planned coming up and that, that portion will be confidential because a lot of those things have not been made public yet. So uh, the five things we want to talk about, uh, Judd mentioned renewable natural gas, talk a little bit about our energy efficiency programs. Uh, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about hydrogen, some of the Utah with our operations to help with fugitive emissions, and then some things that uh, Wexpro is doing on their operations side. So Judd mentioned renewable natural gas. Um, and this is something that uh, is very, we're very excited about, something that, uh, that we're looking forward to um, being more involved in. But to tell you kind of where we're at right now, some of you may remember last year, about this time, we were working on getting a green firm voluntary uh, renewable natural gas program approved. And what this allows customers to do is to, they can buy a block of renewable, enter, new, renewable natural gas a block is five therms, and they can. I think it's five dollars for a block. So we started the program in uh, January 31st of last year. So we're coming up on our one-year anniversary, and uh, already we've had 1,100 participants uh, be involved in that program. So th these are people who who chose to uh, buy blocks. On average, um, these 1,100 participants are buying about uh, two blocks a month, so about a decatherm. Um, which amounts to about 15% of, of their usage if they're a typical, uh, typical homeowner, typical residential user. Uh, in addition to that, um, we've got uh, RNG partnerships. So we've been able to leverage our CNG stations. And when renewable natural gas is used as a transportation fuel, the government gives a, a credit, a, a RIN credit, and so we've uh, partnered with Blue Source, who helps us to uh, supply renewable natural gas at our CNG stations. And then uh, those credits that we receive, we split with Blue Source and uh, the credits that Dominion Energy Utah, the, the, the revenue that we get, we credit back to customers in the pass through. And then we also have a, a new renewable natural gas tariff uh, that many of you are involved in, um, and we have a customer fleet saver. So they have their own uh, customers who, who have a fleet card, and the, these customers are able to fill up at our stations, and uh, fleet saver provides the renewable natural gas at those stations for, for those customers. So uh, great opportunity um, on our system to, to use you know, assets that we already had, um, to, to help uh, encourage the use of renewable natural gas. I mentioned, you know, a few projects, um, and one that we're really excited about uh, is the Wasatch Resource Recovery. So this is a wastewater treatment plant in Davis County, and on December 18th, uh, they began injecting renewable natural gas into our system. 
Uh, and so that's, that's a project that uh, has been very cool to watch uh, be developed. Um, and they were able to invest and, and make it uh, cost effective. And uh, so that one's online. Judd mentioned uh, Dominion's partnership with Smithfield Foods. Uh, uh, Two billion dollars. Uh, we're hoping to invest in um, renewable natural gas projects across the country. And the first project of that kind, as Judd mentioned, was in, here in Utah in Milford. So we had a number of uh, of hog farms uh, that have been now set up to gather RNG. So you can see uh, the black uh, area in the back of those, uh, of those uh, buildings is where the waste is collected. And uh, rather than that waste being uh, turned, you know, just naturally going into the air, it's captured and uh, it's collected and then it's put onto, it's actually Kern River uh, where it's, it's delivered to, to customers. So um, there's some pretty exciting things going on here in Utah uh, related to renewable natural gas. And, and uh, we really, as Judd mentioned, uh, really see it as, as a fuel of the future. So moving on to energy efficiency programs. Uh, we began our energy efficiency programs in 2007. And uh, in the last 13 years, we've had 45% of our customers participate in at least one program. Uh, uptake of, of participation, just to give you an idea, uh, you know, on a, on a comparable metric, the AGA, uh, if you look at, at the other, other utilities who are involved in this, uh, the AGA would report that it takes most utilities over 20 years to, to get to that level of participation. So, you know, kudos to Mike Orton. He's been able to do in 13 years what it takes most utilities 20 plus years to do. Um, but we've had a lot of success in these programs. You can see some of the numbers here, uh, $220 million in rebates, resulting in annual, uh, annual savings of, 100, of equal to 100,000 homes. And just if you wanna know what that means in terms of decatherms, a typical uh, customer or typical residential customer, million or eight million decatherms per year of savings. Uh, due to these these rebates that have that have been uh, given to customers, and even though the the program is um, mature, you know we've been doing this for 13 years. We're continuing to look for ways to incent customers, um, and most recently with our our budget that was recently approved, um, we we received approval for this uh, dual fuel heating system, where a customer can install an electric heat, heat pump with a furnace, uh, gas furnace backup and receive an incentive for that. And uh, actually the savings on, on that particular uh, measure are extremely high, 50% uh, per year uh, for a typical. So we're, we're continuing, even though, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mature program, we're continuing to look for ways to help customers. And, you know, the tagline there on the right, you say, if it says, if you can serve, you can save. Um, we're conserving not only energy, but uh, carbon as well. And so going forward, um, we, we, this will be an important part uh, of our sustainability plan. And Judd's gonna talk a little bit about hydrogen. Perfect, thanks Kelly. Uh, so one of the major pieces of our sustainability program going forward is hydrogen. And I don't know if, if many of you are very familiar with hydrogen. Uh, there are a couple of ways to make hydrogen. You can make hydrogen via a process called steam methane reformation, which basically takes natural gas and converts it to hydrogen. Or you can make what they're calling green hydrogen, which is a relatively, uh, relatively new technology using excess electricity generated with renewables. So um, if, for example, there are times of the day when there is a lot of excess renewable solar generated on the system. You can then take that renewable solar power and convert it to hydrogen. Uh, we think there's great opportunity in this because you can then take that hydrogen and transport it through the natural gas infrastructure. And one of the things that we're interested in is looking at blending hydrogen into the natural gas system with the, the, the natural gas that we have in our system 
to, uh, to, to lessen our carbon footprint. So we've started or kicked off a hydrogen blending pilot program. And what we're, what we're, the intent of the program is to validate some research that's already been done. We were a part of, of a study called the High Ready Study, which was an international study um, looking at LDC uh, distribution, looking at distribution systems to determine a reasonable level at which hydrogen could be blended without affecting the system, whether it's appliances or meters or pipe, uh, anything like that. The high ready study came back and said that they think um, without any changes to the system at all, it's reasonable to blend up to 5% hydrogen right now. Um, however, they did say that uh, every system's different. Every system should validate that that's a reasonable number. And so we decided to kick off that this program to validate that 5% number. Um, the first phase of our program will be a, a pilot at our, at our uh, training facility west of downtown Salt Lake City. We have a, a training facility out there that includes a dozen or so little, I call them huts. They're set up like homes. Um, each, each of them has a meter. Inside each of them, we have a, appliances, stoves, water heaters, furnaces, things like that. Um, and then we have a, a intermediate pressure distribution system set up there. It's, it's really like a mini city. Um, we intend to go in and do a pilot project there. We've ordered the equipment. Um, it'll be set up here likely this month. Uh, and by the end of Q1 this year, uh, we expect our testing to be done. We intend to focus on the, the pipelines, the meters, the appliances, uh, and just make sure that it's reasonable or that we actually, it's feasible to actually blend uh, two to 5% hydrogen at that training facility. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, and this is from an operation standpoint, our fugitive methane emissions. And I mentioned earlier that uh, we've been working on this for, for decades, really, but I thought I provide you with some information that you might find interesting. And so we're talking about, we're talking here about methane emissions from, uh, you know, equipment or from meters, things like that. They're fugitive meth methane emissions that uh, escape from our system and vent to atmosphere. I've provided for you on the, the top uh, donut graph, a, a snapshot of the 2019 emissions from all of Dominion Energy. So you'll see it's all of the gas distribution companies, uh, DEO, which is Ohio, um, out here in the West with the EUWI, our North Carolina, West Virginia, uh, South Carolina affiliates. You'll see that um, DEUWI makes up about 10% of the total emissions from Dominion Energy. Of that 10% of emissions, about 99% of the emissions that come from our system here in the West come from three sources. They come from equipment leaks, uh, they come from meters, whether residential or industrial and commercial, and they come from pipeline dig-ins. And we've identified um, we've identified those leaks there, the, or we've identified those sources there, and the amount that comes from each of those sources. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing to help reduce these leaks. And and uh, just so you're aware, there's a lot of great work that's already been done, as I mentioned previously, with equipment leaks. Um, we were able to remove from our system all of the, the high emitting types of pipe, at least according to the EPA, the high emitting uh, types of pipe, whether that's bare steel or cast iron, uh, those type of pipes have all, pipe have, have all been removed from our system. But um, to further reduce our equipment leaks, we uh, leak survey our system, the entire system, every five years. So we do about 20% of the system this year. In, 29, in 2020, uh, we surveyed nearly 22 million feet of pipeline um, and just under 200,000 services for the year. Uh, from those, we identified 488 leaks, uh, all, of which were, all of which were fixed within um, weeks of identifying those leaks. So we take a proactive approach in trying to identify those. Um, just so you're aware, this number, the, the total MCF of just under 400,000 MCF uh, industry-wide, that's an amazing number. Um, it puts us well below uh, a 1% uh, methane intensity is what it's called, uh, which it, it's, a, it's a great number when you compare us to our peer companies. So we're doing a lot there. 
Um, pipeline dig-ins is something we focused on a lot in 2020. You may or may not be aware, but we implemented a, a civil penalty in 2020 for excavators who have unsafe uh, digging practices. So if an excavator fails to call 811 and hits one of our pipelines, they, they receive this penalty on a first offense. It's $2,500 penalty that's paid to the state of Utah. Um, and on the second offense and any offense thereafter, it's a $5,000 penalty. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's paid to the state of Utah. Further on pipeline dig-ins, we're in the coming year going to implement a new risk modeling software. It's called Urbant. Uh, and basically what it does is it, 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 we load into it all of the upcoming jobs, all of the excavations that we're aware of. It takes a look at the excavator's record. It takes a look at the area in which they're doing business. It looks at our mapping and, and the age of the mapping for that certain area where they're doing the excavations. And it'll, it'll kick out a risk model. And it'll tell us, okay, here are the areas that you need to be most concerned about. Here are the excavations you need to be most concerned about. And when those, uh, when the software kicks out those excavations, we then send damage prevention specialists out to be on the job. So they're there working. They meet with the excavator before digging starts just to make sure everything's done correctly. And, and we try to limit the, the dig-ins. We've seen in the last few months, we've seen a significant decrease in the dig-ins in our system. And we think some of that, some of our efforts are paying off. We've also hired additional damage prevention specialists. We just hired one in the southern part of our region, down in St. George, Cedar City area, who works with, uh, who goes out and works with the excavators to ensure that that they understand the process, how to get uh, markings, that, to call 811, things like that. So we're, we're actively working to reduce the sources, uh, to reduce emissions from these different sources. And we've done a great job so far, and we feel like we can do even more. Thanks, Judd. Okay, thanks, Judd. This is uh, Casey Workle with WexPro. Um, and what we want to cover is some of the WEXPRO sustainability initiatives, real similar to what Judd covered for DUWI. Um, WEXPRO, we're a little bit larger percentage. We're about 30% of Dominion uh, gas distribution companies overall methane emissions. And when you break down ours, it's real similar to what Judd had. We have three sources that total about 98% of our overall methane emissions. Um, our largest category by far is pneumatic devices, uh, and what a in the next slide I kind of I got a picture of a pneumatic device and I'll kind of explain it a little better. But um, all of our wells are run off of natural gas because they're remote well locations. We don't have utility power, um, so us along with <clears throat> all of our industry peers on the well locations typically use wellhead gas to drive all your pneumatic controllers. Um, we've been trying for a few years now to find a solution to eliminate those uh, pneumatic devices. Years ago, before regulation, we switched all of those to low bleed devices. Um, so we're using the least amount uh, that we can, but we're testing out a couple options now um, to eliminate those pneumatic devices. Uh, so far, our testing has, has proved out and uh, we're, we're targeting to reduce that, that category, our largest category, to a 100% reduction by 2030, um, which will drive our, our emissions drastically down. Uh, so that's a real good promising project that we're, we're working on and, and have been for a little while. Our second largest is well venting for liquid unloading of wells. So as all wells make some form of fluid, I think I kind of covered that in one of these meetings on hydrates that all wells make natural gas uh, along with some water and condensate. So um, over time, as the wells deplete downhole pressure, that liquid accumulates in the well bore and the well will what you call liquid load. So you'll get enough liquid downhole that it doesn't have enough energy to bring that to surface. Um, historically, the easiest way to get the well back online <clears throat> is to just blow the well down. As you decrease surface pressure, you can essentially lift that load, bring it to surface. <clears throat> Another way is uh, deploying plungers. Um, and again, on the next graph I, or the next slide, I've got a, a graphic showing a plunger and I'll explain a little better uh, on that. But you, you deploy a plunger on the well and the plunger will just cycle in the well. As it becomes loaded, the plunger drops the surface, effectively seals off the bottom, turns the well on and brings it to surface. So 
we've been deploying plungers um, more uh, systematically in the past five years, um, and it's proven out well. We've we've deployed uh, we deploy on average about forty plungers a year, um, and and it's proven out well. So that when you deploy a plunger, you essentially it brings that fluid load to um, and negates the necessity of having to unload it by blowing the, the well to, to atmosphere. So deploying the plungers helps you not have the liquid loading and not have to vent the, the fluid. And uh, the other thing we're looking at doing is plungers aren't a cure-all. It won't fix every well, and even plunger wells have to be blown from time to time. So we're going to engage a combustion company that, that builds our combustors that we use on our well sites to see if we can build some trailer mounted combustor so that when the wells do have to be unloaded or, or blown to atmosphere, instead of venting raw methane to the atmosphere, we can burn it and convert it to CO2. And, and I'm sure you've heard before that CO2 is 25 times less harmful to the environment than methane. So um, both through the plunger deployments and the, the combustors, we're targeting emission reduction of, of that 17%. We're going to drop that by 85% by 2030. So another great project to reduce our other big uh, emission source. And real quick, I don't have any information, but similar to what Judd had on the equipment leaks, we at Wexbro, we do uh, voluntary LDAR surveys on every well location every year. Um, it's not regulated, not mandated by the states. We do have some regulated uh, LDAR surveys that we have to do on certain locations, but we have a dedicated LDAR person that does the required ones and then when he's got free time we hit every well location every year trying to drop that uh equipment leak and and some of judd when we do find a, a leak we typically fix it within a week um and no longer than two weeks so uh, another great project um, that we have deployed so on the next slide i kind of just real quick brief go over you know, what a plunger, what a pneumatic controller are, because a lot of people may not be familiar with it. So on the right is a typical picture of a wellhead um, graphic. And the plunger is the actual device that goes inside your tubing. So it's the black thing in the middle of the pipe. And then you can see kind of a grayed out version down below. So that's what a plunger is. So when the well loads up, the well will shut itself in. That plunger will then drop to surface, and really what the plunger does is it just effectively seals off that bottom hole so that you don't have the liquid. You don't have to rely on velocity to bring the liquid up. That, that plunger forms a seal and brings the fluid to surface. So every time that well starts to load up, the well will automatically shut in with our SCADA controllers. The plunger will drop, grab the liquid, and then when it's ready, the well will turn on and bring that plunger back to surface. Um, and then the, the bottom picture there is a typical pneumatic controller so really what it does is it just takes the wellhead pressure and natural gas to drive all of our controllers and valves to whatever position we need them to so on a typical well location we have eight to ten pneumatic devices that control levels of separators pressures flows um, and this one here is just a flow control valve that would use the pneumatic pressure to control the movement of the valve so it would use that pressure to open or close the valve um, so just kind of give a brief overview of what the pneumatic controller is thanks casey well this is probably a good time to pause for questions on the first section if there are any and i can't see if your hands raised so if you have a question just uh, blurt it out Sure, this is this is Thad. Can you hear me? Yeah. I just have a question about the uh, the pilot program that was discussed earlier for hydrogen mixing with the five percent target. Is is that five percent target? Does they, they, he? I think I remember the presentation saying wouldn't require any system adjustments. Does that include customer adjustments on furnaces and appliance and things like that? Yes, that's correct. Uh, at least according to the study that we were a part of, the high ready study, um, we don't believe that at 5% it will require any adjustments to appliances, to water heaters, furnaces, stoves, anything like that. But um, our pilot program, part of the reason we're doing it is to test that out, to make sure that's the case, that there are no issues with orifices, things like that. So yes, you're right. We don't believe there'll be any adjustments 
at 5%. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, uh, I think this is where we're going to go into the confidential part of the meeting. I don't know if there's anybody on. Um, I guess I will. I will let uh, Jen maybe look at the list and see if there's any name she doesn't recognize. The only name I don't recognize is Gre Greg Sopkin. I'm wondering which entity he represents. I noticed that uh, the, the participant as well, he's not showing up on my list any longer. Might have checked out. Quickly look. I just got a notification that Greg Sumpkin left. Okay, great. Let me just quickly scroll through. So as she's scrolling, scrolling through, um, I'll just maybe mention why this piece is confidential. So uh, Dominion Energy has four gas LDCs. Uh, we've got the, this obviously Questar here in Utah, Wyoming, Idaho. Uh, there's one in West Virginia. They have, they have one in Ohio, one in North Carolina, and then they have two electric utilities, one in Virginia and one in South Carolina. And so as part of... Um, their investor presentation, I think it's going to be in February, they're going to be rolling out uh, initiatives across their entire footprint. And so what you're going to see today are some of the initiatives um, that will be rolled into that presentation. Um, but because it had not been made public yet to investors, um, they they definitely wanted the regulators to know what was going on, but they they were sensitive to uh, just, you know, to, to disclosure. So, um, we're going to talk about uh, several things that we've got planned uh, coming up here here in our service territory. And um, I think if you're okay, Jim, can we proceed? So we just had somebody named Jacob add, and I'm not sure that I know who Jacob represents. Okay. Jacob Richardson? Yes, I'm with, with the PSC staff. Uh, oh, perfect. Welcome. Nice Thank to meet you. you. We're good to go, Kelly. You're in then. <laughs> okay. Uh,